How many of you brought your Bible with you tonight? Will you hold up the Bible all over the building? And if you will, I'd like for you to take your Bible and join me in the book of Galatians tonight, chapter number 5. Galatians chapter 5, page number 1247, if you have an old Schofield Bible, or Galatians chapter 5. And I want to read some verses here in a moment, and then I'll ask you to follow me as we kind of just work through this text a little bit tonight. Our buses today did a good job of bringing people to the house of God. We had a total of 280. 86 riders on our church buses today, and that is a great crowd, a good number of people. We had one of our routes that were unable to run today, but everybody else did a great job uh, of bringing people to church. 286 riders. The top bus was the, uh, was the uh, let's see, the Pofftown route. They had 51 the South Winston route had 41, and then one of our Spanish routes had 35, and I appreciate all that. Uh, the uh, West Winston route had 14. The Kernersville route had 5. Uh, the South Winston route, 41. The Rural Hall route had 32. And uh, the Mount Airy route had 18. The Murray Road route had 31. Uh, as I said, the Pofftown route had 51. The Ogburn Station route had 12. The Siloam route had 15. And time you throw the other Spanish routes in, 286 riders on our church buses today. What a good crowd, and I appreciate that. If, if you appreciate the hard work of our bus workers, would you say amen? I appreciate that. That's a whole lot of door knocking yesterday and reaching out to folks. And then Brother uh, Tim White, Brother Tim preached over the truck stop this morning, and he got to preach to three people over there. All three of them were saved, but at least he got to preach to somebody. And uh, so I appreciate the, the work that's going on in and around our community, and to uh, thank the Lord for the good outreach from our church. Well, let's to read tonight, Galatians chapter 5. I want to begin reading with verse number 16, and I'd like to read down through verse number 24. And here's what the Bible said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I, also, as I have told you uh, in the past, also in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. What great verses tonight. I hope you'll leave your Bible open as we try to unpackage all this tonight here in just a few minutes. Let's pray. Father, please bless your word and help us tonight as we look at this text together. And I pray the Spirit of God will have something in this text that will help us to go out this week and to live like a child of God ought to live. Lord, may we fight the flesh and may we yield to the Spirit. I pray in these days, in Jesus' name, Amen. You know, if there's one thing that God desires out of every one of His children, in fact, not only desires it, but He also requires it, it is that we as God's people bring forth fruit. Fruit. God wants fruit in your life. In fact, here's what the Bible says about that. In John 15 and verse number 16, the Bible says, Yes. Let's see, yes, you have not chosen me. I can't see with my glasses on. You have not started start to talk about tithing. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit right, might remain. In fact, when it comes to fruit in the Bible and what Jesus said about fruit, we find that there is a sequence when it comes to the subject of fruit in the life of the believer. In John chapter 15 and verse number 2, we read, these words right here. John 15 and verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus said that we ought to bear fruit. Bear fruit. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on a little bit later in this same verse and he says this, I not only want you to bear fruit, but he also says I want you to bear more fruit. 
Not just fruit, but more fruit. But he's still not through because in the same chapter, he drops down just a few verses, and then he says this, I want fruit, I want more fruit, but then I want much fruit fruit. Now, if you're wondering why God saved you, God saved you that you might have some fruit, and then you might have some more fruit, and then ultimately that ye and I, you and I might bear much fruit. In fact, John 15 and verse 8, the whole verse says this right here, herein is my Father glorified. You want to glorify the Lord? You want to honor God? You want God's blessings on your life, God's approval? Jesus said, this glorifies my Father that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So the way we bring glory to God as God's people, the way we bring, bring pleasure to the heart of God as a child of God is to bring forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. But have you ever noticed how that works in the opposite in the lives of most believers? You see, most of the time when we get saved, uh, when we first come into the family of God, there's some fruit there. There's some fruit. But instead of then progressing, it seems like we, we regress. I mean, there's fruit, and then there's less fruit, until finally, there's no fruit. The older we get, the more fruit we ought to be bringing forth. But in reality, it seems like with most of us, and I said us, most of us, it seems like that works in the opposite. When we first get saved, there's fruit, a lot of fruit, and then it tails off until finally we're just going to go to heaven and there's no fruit. Well, the Bible said that, 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 that sequence ought to work in the opposite. Hey, when we first get saved, man, there ought to be some fruit. Then a little bit later as we grow in grace, there ought to be more fruit. And then as we come to fully understand the Bible and God's plan and will for our lives, there ought to be much fruit. Now, how's that working in your life? Have you gone from fruit to more fruit to much fruit? Or have you gone from a lot of fruit to little fruit to now no fruit? Well, I'm preaching in these uh, Sunday nights on the subject of fruitful, fruitful living. Jesus wants fruit in our lives. And may we, as we set about, what is today? Today's date is the 24th. So we're 24 days into this brand new year. And you know, our desire this year ought to bring in, ought to be to bring in a bumper crop for the Lord this year when it comes to fruit in our life. Boy, we ought to set about this year to, to live the fruitful life, fruitful living. And I want to, eventually what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with verse 22 and verse number 23 in a series of sermons on the fruit of the Spirit, fruitful living. But I want to kind of set the stage for that tonight. I'm not going to preach that tonight, but I would like to set the stage for it by just talking about these, these verses that I've read tonight as they deal with us as the child of God. You know, there's some great, there's some great counsel about the Christian life that we find in these verses here tonight. So let me mention three things about the Christian life. First of all, I want you to see, number one, what I want to call the conflict of the Christian life, the conflict of the Christian life. Now, if you look at verse 16 and verse number 17, we kind of get the idea that the Christian life is a life of struggles. It is a life of battles, great conflict in the Christian life. You know, right after you get saved, I think we all make the startling discovery that the Christian life is not a life of ease. It's not, a, it's not a bed of roses. Uh, it's not, you know, pie in the sky and a sweet by and by, uh, you know, kind of a living. But to be a Christian, to try to live for God, means to, as a child of God, I'm going to be involved in a war, in a battle. And so are you. I want to put a statement up on the screens, and if y'all will leave it up for just a moment. And the statement goes like this. A Christian is somebody whom the war is over, the victory is won, and the battle begins. Now, I know that sounds a little bit contradictory, doesn't it? The war is over, the victory is won, and the battle begins. Well, let's understand this. You know, before we got saved, we were at war with God. The Bible said that we were at enmity with God. In fact, uh, when, before we got saved, us and God wasn't heading in the same directions. I mean, we were pulling in opposite directions, and we were actually at war 
with God. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, God was trying to do something in my life, and I was rebelling. I was resisting with every fiber of my being to keep God's will from being done, God's plan from being done in my life. I can't tell you how many services that I said in church under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, hanging on for dear life because I didn't want what God wanted for my life. But there came a good day in my life when I waved the white flag of surrender, and when I came to Jesus, guess what? The war with God was over. The Bible said in Romans 5, verse number 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The only way you can make peace with God is to receive His Son, Jesus. And when you do that, God officially declares the hostilities are over, the war is over, and the victory has been won. Because of Jesus, I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me, uh, loved me and gave himself for me. I'm glad tonight I am on, we see it, I'm on the winning side. The war is over. Amen. The victory is won. Thank God for Jesus. But now the war begins. The war begins. Now, what do I mean by that? The battle begins. Well, these verses tonight teach us there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on inside of you, and there is a battle going on inside of me. It's a war. It's a conflict. It's a strife. It is a struggle, a fight going on inside of us. The Christian life is not a playground. The Christian life is a battleground. The Christian life is not a waltz. The Christian life is a war. We are in a battle. Uh, every day of our life as a child of God. Have you ever stopped to think about this? There are 10 battles that we face every day of our life. 10 different wars, and every day of our life, you and I have to fight these wars in our lives. Let me list the 10 battles for you, and I'll do it quickly. First of all, there's the battle of light versus darkness. Now, those of us that are saved, the Bible said we walk in the light. But let's just wait a minute. Let's just be honest. Boy, darkness is trying to creep back in. Amen. Darkness is trying to put out the light that is on the inside of us. So every day of our life, there's a battle going on, light versus darkness. Number two, there's a battle of this, truth versus error. Man, there's so much error in this world, so much going on, so much being said in this world, but can't be backed up with the Bible. And we got to be careful that we don't fall into error and we stay with the truth of the Word of God. And every day, we have to fight the battle of not only light and darkness, but truth and error. Try the spirits, the Bible said, whether they be of God. The Bible said, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Truth and error. Boy, I don't want to be led astray. Truth and error. Light and darkness. Number three, heaven and earth. You know, somebody said before you get saved, your choices are this, heaven and hell, before you get saved. But after you get saved, the choice is this, heaven or earth. Am I going to live for heaven with heaven in view or am I going to be one of them earth dwellers and just live for the nasty now and now? That's a battle every day of our life. we got to fight. Which world are we living for? Light and darkness, truth and error, heaven and hell. Number four, boom, faith versus doubt every day. Well, I'll tell you what, that's true during this pandemic, isn't it? Faith versus doubt. I mean, man, a lot of people just don't believe that God can take care of them. They don't have the faith that the same God that will save them can keep us saved. And, and boy, how many people wrestle with their salvation? And, man, they're constantly getting saved all over again. And they want to get saved again. All that, the faith and the doubt that creeps in their life. And we have to face that battle every day of our life. What about this battle right here? Spirituality versus carnality. We have to choose. Am I going to be spiritually minded or am I going to be carnally minded? The Bible said to be carnally minded, Romans chapter 5, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How are you going to live your life? Are you going to be spiritual? That doesn't mean we're perfect, but that just means we're trying to mind the things of the Spirit of God. Or are we going to be carnal and live a fleshly life dictated by the philosophies and the ideologies of the world? How are you going to live your life? That's a battle. What about this battle? Boldness versus fear. Oh, brother, you know why more of us don't witness, why most of us don't witness no more than we do? Fear. We, we can talk about ball games. We can talk about 
shows on TV. We can talk about, you, I mean, you ladies can, recipes or whatever ladies talk about, sewing machines or whatever, Walmart, whatever. We can talk about any of that stuff, but when it comes to talking about the Lord, pff, get the lock jaw and can't say a word. Why? Fear grips our heart. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God wants us to be bold for him. Boldness versus fear. Number next, thankfulness versus ingratitude. How many of us have to face that battle every day? How many of us are constantly going to God? God, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we never stop to say, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've given to me. I'm telling you, that's a battle that we face every day of our lives. Thankfulness versus ingratitude. What about this one? Forgiveness versus bitterness. Somebody comes along, does something to you, hurts you real bad then wants to run up to you and talk to you again. And, and what you want to do is smack them in Jesus' name, but you got to try to forgive them for crying out loud. Can I have an amen? amen? Boy, that's a battle, isn't it? Forgiveness versus bitterness. Hey, what about this one? Giving versus selfishness. Battles that we face. But without doubt, the greatest battle that any of us face is this battle right here the battle of the spirit versus the flesh. Now, if you'll notice in our text, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the capital S spirit, capital S spirit, Holy Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the capital S spirit, Holy Spirit, and the spirit, capital S spirit, lusteth or warreth or fighteth against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. I read over in Romans chapter 7, boy, Paul faced that great internal struggle. Remember that? Romans chapter 7, he said, man, that which I could do, should do, I don't do, and that which I shouldn't do, I do do if that makes sense. And he said, man, there's a battle going on, in the si on inside of me. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7, 24. But in verse 25, he said, thank God Jesus will one of these days. But until he does, man, there's a battle. Your old flesh, your old sinful nature, we have an external enemy, the world. We have an infernal enemy, the devil. But we all have an internal enemy. It is the flesh. When you were born into this world, we were born with a fleshly nature. That's the reason Jesus said in John chapter 3 and in verse number 6, Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Your first birth that brought you into this world, you were born with a fleshly nature, a sinful nature, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Maybe that explains why some lost people do some of the things they do. They're just following the flesh. They're just following what comes naturally. They're just following the sinful nature. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But aren't you glad there came a good day in your life when you got born again? And when you got born again, the Bible said in the rest of that verse, and that which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit. I said on Wednesday night, when Jesus saved me, I became a partaker of God's divine nature. Thank God when I got saved, Jesus moved in. When I got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. But here's the kicker. When the Holy Spirit moved in, the flesh didn't move out. He just moved over. And the truth of the matter is, every one of us in this building tonight have got two natures in us. We have a spiritual nature, that which is born of God, the Holy Spirit. We have a fleshly nature, that sinful nature that hasn't been eradicated, that still is just as wicked and lost as it ever was. And I'm telling you, there's a war going on inside of you. A battle, a struggle, a strife, a conflict. And it's going on on the inside of each other. The Bible said there in verse 17, they would stand each other. It's kind of like this. We got a butterfly and a bug in us. A butterfly, a little butterfly, he wants to fly in the heavenlies. He wants to reach the heights. But then we got that old bug in us that wants to dwell in the dark and in the dirt. And they fight with each other constantly, flesh versus spirit. Some of y'all faced that battle when you got up this morning. The alarm clock went off. 
The Spirit said, time for church. Rise and shine. The flesh said, you're tired. Now, who won the battle? Who won the war? Every day of our life. Wednesday night, we drag in, and uh, you come to work, get off work, and you're tired, and you give out. Maybe you had a hard day, and you get home, fry that bologna sandwich, or crack open that can of potted meat, put it on some crackers, and the, and the Spirit says, time, to, time for church. And the flesh said, ain't no time. Time for the recliner is what it's time for. And the battle's on. We got to decide every day. Have you ever noticed how that works over at the mall when it comes to giving? Have you ever noticed how big a $100 bill looks at church and how small it looks at Haynes Mall? Have you ever noticed that? I mean, when it comes time to fill out that tithing envelope, slip that 100 200 500 whatever it is you give, and the more you give, thank you and God bless you. But have you ever noticed that $100 check or bill or whatever as you slip in that tithe? Man, it looks huge. And the flesh said, what are you going to do this week without that? You're going to starve to death without that. You Put that back in your pocket. And when you get over at the Haynes, Haynes Mall, the flesh said, man, don't. It says, man, ain't this good? It's good. I'm telling you, it's wonderful. But over here at the church, the flesh says, that's, man, you can't live without that. But the spirit says, you're doing what God wants you to do. God's going to bless you. It is a battle, a conflict every day of our lives. 24-7, 365. Your flesh will never go on vacation. It'll never take a day off. It'll never get COVID. Sad but true. It won't have to check into the intensive care unit at the hospital. None of that will happen. It'll be there every day of your life. And we've got to decide who we're going to follow, who we're going to live for, who's going to control our life, who's going to call the shots. Every day we've got to make up our mind. Will it be the Spirit? Or the flesh. There's a conflict. Can I have an amen? amen? But not only is there a conflict, look again in this text, there is a contrast. Now let me tell you something. If you look beginning in verse number 19 and following, we're told how, how opposite these two natures are. I mean, we're told, I mean, I think most of us will live and die and not realize how dangerous the flesh is. Can I have an Amen. I think most of us just kind of idle through the Christian life and we don't realize how dangerous our flesh is. If we did, we'd pay more attention to spiritual matters. If we understood how dangerous our flesh is, we'd read our Bibles every day. I wouldn't have to fuss at you about coming, and I won't have to fuss at y'all anyway. You're here tonight. What low-down crowd that's not here, though? Have to fuss at them, get after them about church? If we understood how dangerous the flesh is in our life, I'm telling you what it wants to do in our life, contrasted to what the Spirit of God wants to do, there's not even a choice of who we should be following. If you want to look what the flesh wants to do in your life, let me show you what I want to call the fiascos of the flesh. Look, if you will, beginning in verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then if I counted them correctly, he names off 17 things. That if, and then he says this, and the such like. So, I mean, this is not even a complete exhaustive list of what the flesh wants to do in your life. I mean, there's so much more. And what an ugly picture this is. Can I tell you really what verse... What verse number 19 and 20 and 21 really describes? The world we're living in. It is, a, it is a world controlled by fleshly desires and fleshly lust. And the Bible said, if you look there, it's what are, what's, the, what's the flesh want to do? Adultery. The flesh wants you to ruin your life, get caught up in some scandalous, adulterous affair. Then it talks about there in verse number 19, uh, uh, fornication, all kinds of unlawful, unbiblical sexual activity, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, and, and all the way down through here, what an ugly picture of a life that the flesh wants you and me to become. Man, I'm telling you, that's, that's awful looking there. That's the world we're living in. We're God's people. We're called to a higher standard of living. This stuff is not to dominate our life. The flesh is not to control us. We're to yield to the Spirit of God every day so this mess, this ugly picture doesn't become who we are as a child of God. 
And Paul even goes on to say at the end of verse number 21 that people who do these things ain't going to heaven. And that's in the Greek. Ain't going to heaven. You said, the preacher, hold on just a minute. Do you mean to tell me if I were to go out and get caught up in one of these things, even though I'm saved, I'm going to be lost? I don't think that's what Paul's saying, but I do think what he's saying is this. People who are saved, this is not the norm of their life. This is the exception of their life. Can I tell you something? If you find yourself living daily in verse 19, 20, and 21, look at me, excuse my English, Shug, you ain't saved. If this is your life, it, and it's on, a, it's on a constant, reoccurring, continual basis. If this is who you are, what you need to do is run down here tonight before Jesus comes and get saved by the grace of God because if this is the norm of your life, Paul said, you ain't going to heaven. I get it. I know we all can get caught up in junk. David did. David got caught up in adultery. Moses killed somebody for crying out loud. Samson, what a mess his life became. But can I tell you something? That wasn't the norm. That was the exception. That was, the, that was not the rule of their life. That was the exception of their life. And I'm just here to tell you, if your life is in those verses, you need to get saved. The fiascos of the flesh. Oh, what a mess our life can be. Boy, don't people get their lives in a mess. Isn't it amazing? I, boy, I want to thank God tonight. I say this carefully. I really want to say it carefully. But I'm glad at the age of 58 years old tonight, my life's not a mess. Amen. I'm glad I can go home tonight and pillar my head. And I don't have to worry about my wife finding out some old dirty thing that's going on in my life. I can lay down with a good conscience. By the way, there's not a better sleeping pill in the world than a good conscience, a clear conscience. And I can go home tonight by the grace of God, totally by God's grace, and lay my head down and don't have to worry if the phone rings at my house if somebody's going to tell my wife some old long, terrible story that my life has become. I don't want that for my life. I don't want my life to be a mess. You better watch your flesh. Your flesh will lead you down a road that you can't back out of. It'll lead you down a dead-end street, run you off a cliff, and you'll never be the same. The fiascos of the flesh. But then look at verse number 22, 23. Here's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. The fiascos of the flesh. But look at the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, it says nothing about adultery or fornication or witchcraft. I mean, it says nothing about those things. What's the Holy Spirit want to do in your life? He wants to make your life a life of love and joy. Not misery, joy. Look at this, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithful, faithful, uh, faith or faithfulness, meekness, temperance. You know what you got right there? You got a picture of Jesus right there. Every one of those things in verse 22 and 23 is nothing more than just a picture of who Jesus was while he was here. You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do to you? He wants to make you look like Jesus. Can I have an Amen. I mean, we're even told in the Bible, we're even told in the Bible that God wants us to be conformed into the image of His Son. Romans 12, 2, this is the wrong kind of confirmation. And be not conformed to this world. That's, not, that's what we don't want. That's what the flesh wants. He wants us to be like the world. So He wants us to get on that stinking Facebook, not Facebook, yeah, Facebook, whatever it's called, Wastebook. He wants to get on there and spread all kind of dirty stuff on a stinking Facebook and tell all the garbage that's going... Nobody wants to know that mess. Keep that. If you're in a mess, keep it to yourself. You're going to save me some headaches going down the road. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. But we're told this. We're told to be conformed to the image of God's Son. God wants to make up. The Holy Spirit wants to make me and you look like Jesus. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, Kindness, goodness, meekness, long-suffering, faithfulness, meekness, temper, all of those things he wants to make us look. So there's a, con there's a, there's a conflict. It's a war going on inside of me. <laughs> Did you see where that guy got knocked out last night? I didn't watch it. I don't have that channel. But that old boy that's supposed to whoop everybody, and that little old whippersnapper come out there, 
kicked him in the leg a couple of times, got him worrying about him kicking, and, and one time when he raised his leg, he dropped his guard up, poof, right in the kisser. Knocked him out. Boy, it is amazing how the, Holy, how the flesh wants to distract us. And about that time, poof, and we're knocked out. Amen. The con, the con, the conflict and the contrast. But I'm done now. Look at this. I want to talk about the conquest. So how do we do it? How do we stay out of verse 19, 20, and 21? And how do we get into verse 21 and verse 22? That is the $10 million question. How do I keep out of the fiascos of the flesh? And how do I get into that fruit of the Spirit? How do I do that? Well, these Galatian believers had it all wrong. Because they thought the way to, uh, to uh, keep your life from getting messed up by the flesh was, was by making it live by a list of do's and don'ts. Can I tell you something? You can get every list of do's and don'ts you want to in your Christian life, and each and every time the flesh will rebel against it. Can I, am I, am I, can I get an amen out of the, the boot-wearing crowd over here? Me and you is the only ones got any sense up here anymore. We wear shoes. This crowd over here is wearing boots now. Fiascos of the flesh, fruit of the Spirit. How do we stay out of boots? And how do we keep on shoes? I'm kidding, boys. How do we do that? Well, you can't legislate your flesh. You can't get you a rule, a list of rules of do's and don'ts and say, okay, here from now on, I'm living by this list here. I'm going to get victory over my flesh. Are you kidding me? Your flesh will jump up and pop you in the kisser every time and mess your life up. You can't beat your flesh with a list of do's and don'ts. Can I have an amen? So how do you defeat the flesh? How do you live in verse 22 and 23 instead out of verse 19 and so forth? How do you do that? Only one way. Walk in the Spirit. That word walk, walk in the Spirit simply means this. It means to walk around. It simply means this, to live our lives in the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. So every day of my life, if I'm going to stay out of that mess in verse 19, 20, and 21, and if I'm going to stay in that good stuff in verse 22 and 23, every day of my life, I'm going to have to yield myself to the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I can't do it on my own. I don't have the ability. I know, I know I need to stay out of that mess. But if I'm not careful and I don't let the Holy Spirit control my life, I'll find myself with a messed up life and a messed up family, and a messed up church if I don't live in the presence and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We yield ourselves daily. We seek His fullness in our lives. I'm closing now. I don't know who said this. I want to say Billy Sunday did. I'm not sure. But I'm going to put, I put this up on the screen. Look at this verse. The average Christian of our day is so subnormal that if he ever became normal, people would think he's abnormal. We are so under par that if we ever became par, people would think they're above par. Subnormal that if we became normal, people would think we've lost our crazy mind. But can I tell you what the Holy Spirit wants to do? The Holy Spirit simply wants to make you normal. That's all He wants to do. And if somebody said they have lost their mind, they have just fell off the deep end, so be it. Most people, people have always looked at the Christian that is on fire for Jesus as being a fanatic anyway, a crazo. You know, no, 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 no. He's just normal. It is a sight when new converts have to backslide to get in fellowship with the rest of the church. Amen and amen. So we got a conflict. There's a contrast. We don't want to end up like that. But the conquest, the only way we can beat that is to walk in the Spirit. So every day of your life, I encourage you, get up, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Pray for me. Pray for me. I need to yield myself to the Holy Spirit every day of my life, and then and then only can I be normal. 
What? Oh. <laughs> Shut up. Normal. Normal. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible.